the United Nations uh, Academic Impact, which is an initiative that aligns institutions of higher education with the goals and principles of the United Nations. It's uh, uh, truly a privilege to be able to address to you today. Um, this is this event, this virtual event is part of a series of virtual workshops that we have been developing since December about the sustainable development goals, something that is particularly relevant, not, not only because of the challenges that we are all facing around the world, but also because um, we are in the decade of action for the SDGs. The United Nations Academic Impacts is a network of over 1500 members in almost 450 member states of the United Nations. So this this uh, this potential, uh, you know, this uh, knowledge, the expertise, the experience, the research, the, the, the teaching methodologies, the community engagement, the extension programs that are currently conducted by institutions of higher education around the world is truly relevant and important not only for universities themselves but also to the international community as a whole and of course uh, for the United Nations for our organization in order to uh, foster the goals and principles that are enshrined in the United Nations. So at this point, um, you know, institutions of higher education, universities, colleges, but also research centers and think tanks and um, there's their significant contribution to the development um, you know, of, of all the work of the United Nations is something that needs to be highlighted and underlined. So this is the idea of the event that we are going to have in a couple of minutes uh, from now. And also the idea is to share best practices and the knowledge that the, and to create this uh, global academic cooperation uh, through these kind of uh, activities. And with that, I would like to give the floor now to Jashri Wyatt. Uh, she is the Chief of the Education Outreach Section uh, within the Outreach Division of the United Nations Department of Global Communications. Uh, Jashri, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Omar. I'm just checking that you can hear me well. Perfect. Yes, we okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, Good morning from New York. It's 2 a.m. here and we're extremely pleased to join. I really want to thank Omar um, because of his incredible enthusiasm um, to create. You know, this is the first time we're doing this um, in a time zone really for Asia Pacific. And I know we have a lot of um, people joining us also from Africa. Um, this morning, I know that on our distinguished panel of experts um, and scholars from this region, we have two of our SDG hubs, one from the original Kazakhstan um, hub for sustainability uh, as part of UNAI, and also SDG hub four from the University of Auckland as well. Um, and I think, you know, the rationale for this extraordinary SDG workshop format, which is really a bit different from a regular webinar, is that um, this is an opportunity really for universities and scholars to speak to each other um, about the SDGs and the sustainable development um, agenda. So we're really thrilled to welcome our panelists today, and of course, um, our UN expert for today, um, joining us as well, Ms. Van Nguyen, who is a Sustainable Development Officer at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. So, welcome. Um, I think, as Omar already touched on, this again is a place, it's a convening force, the United Nations Academic Impact, um, really to cultivate uh, the discourse and sharing and ideas and best practices related to your scholarly research and engagement on sustainability. Um, one of the things, uh, that I would like to convey is how much we as the UN, we appreciate the extraordinary work that this particular panel is doing on sustainability, but also of all of the um, folks who are joining us online to engage and to listen to the presentations that you will all make um, today as well. 
I just want to take a moment um, to say that we're excited. Uh, we're going to be working on an SDG toolkit, which we hope will be valuable um, to, uh, to be published later this year. And we'll be making a call for all of you to share some of your best practices. And we hope the, that some of the work that you do can actually be embedded into our SDG toolkit. So just to say, please watch the space. Um, we'll be we'll be launching that, and we'll be we'll be looking for many of you to contribute to that toolkit. I also just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about the Utah Valley um, University is uh, a UNAI member, and they are working to convene the first academic conference on the SDGs. And this conference will be happening between 5 and 7 of October this year, 2022. So I think Omar will be dropping in the link to this conference. Um, I believe the call for papers has already closed, but we're encouraging all of you on this call, and especially those of you who are UNAI um, members, of our network to definitely join for that as well. So um, I think one of the things that I was reflecting on as we were preparing for this SDG workshop is just how important the SDGs and the sustainability um, agenda are. They, they it just couldn't be more important right now. Um, yesterday was the World Oceans Day. And I think sometimes for me in the United Nations system, I've, I've been working in the system for about um, 10 years, I find that um, some of the research and the scientific work can sometimes feel a bit daunting. For example, as we think about oceans, the World Meteorological Organization about a month ago revealed that four key climate indicators broke new records in 2021. Sea level rise, ocean heat, ocean acidification, and greenhouse um, gas concentrations. And so I think some, this triple threat, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution are really threatening the life of our oceans on which we all depend. As some of the scholars on this call um, are well aware, the ocean produces more than 50% of the planet's oxygen. Um, and it's the main source of sustenance, of course, for over a billion people on planet Earth. A third of fish stocks um, uh, are harvested at biologically unsustainable levels. Significant proportion of coral reefs has already been destroyed and plastic pollution, of course, um, has been found in some of the remotest islands and the deepest trenches of our ocean. Um, so I think what this really shows right now is how crucial the sustainable development goals and the objectives of the Paris Agreement on climate change really are, and the SDGs more globally in all kinds of ways. And I think as intellectuals, as researchers, and as scholars, you know, our panelists and all of those uh, folks who are on the line, who are joining this meeting, I think you're at, you know, the, the forefront um, of discovery and knowledge, broadening and expanding our collective global understanding of the fields that you work in. And I think that this knowledge at some moments is, is thrilling, it's exciting. You see the wonders of life through the lens of your research, but you also see the fragilities and vulnerabilities as well. And so we welcome you in the spirit of collaboration and we welcome you in, in the spirit of knowledge and the expansion and understanding of that knowledge. And today in our workshop, we're looking very forward to, um, to engaging with you on how 
research can play an impactful role as we are looking to implement and engage on the sustainability agenda. So uh, with that, I would, uh, I would like to pass the floor back over to Omar, and I wish you a really fruitful discussion this morning and this afternoon and this evening, and uh, we welcome you and really, really are excited to hear what you have to share with this group this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Over. Thank you, Gashi, for your remarks. On behalf of the Education Outreach Section uh, of the Outreach Division of our department, and it's a true privilege, and I can see that we are almost 170 people on this call in addition to the presenters. Um, it is my privilege now to pass the floor to a colleague from the United Nations system, uh, Ms. Van Nguyen. She works as a Sustainable Development Officer at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for the Asia and the Pacific, ESCAP. Uh, she provides support for the follow-up and review of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Prior to this, uh, Ms. Nguyen worked at the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, known as UNESCO, overseeing the portfolio of indigenous rights and knowledge, but also cultural industries, as well as youth and disability inclusive development. And she used to be based in the UNESCO offices in both Vietnam and Samoa. And with that, Ben, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Omar, and thank you, Jayashri, for setting the scene so so nicely and so eloquently. Um, colleagues, it is I'm very honoured, but also very humble today to join a distinguished panel of scholars and intellectuals. Um, and of course, here today we're talking about two important things, research and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It is timely because, um, as, as Jayashri and Omar said in the opening, we are at a very critical turning point for the SDGs. And of all the regions that you are going to launch this series of dialogues and initiatives, none are more critical for global success in achieving the SDGs than Asia and the Pacific. And in some ways, none are as off track as our region. Um, now, let me share a little bit um, uh, from, from our work at ESCAP. Every year we do an annual stock taking of the, of the SDG progress to see how far we have achieved, how far we've gone in, in SDG implementation. And it shows that as a region, we're lagging far behind in the implementation of the SDGs, except for some strong progress on the goal seven on affordable and clean energy or goal nine, industry, infrastructure and innovation. The pace of change, the pace of progress has been simply too slow to reach the goals by 2030. And the data even shows a very, very disturbing trend. The region is moving in the wrong direction when it comes to climate action, goal 13, and uh, responsible consumption and production, goal 12. Um, so, so we are at a very critical turning point, and the task before us is large. We know that from our data, the, the region is going to achieve the SDGs, but in another 30 or 40 years. So it's simply too late. So I, I will be preaching to the converted very much so when I say that in order for us to ex accelerate this SDG progress, science and research is a tool. And but so, so perhaps uh, let me reflect on some of the examples from our own work where we see that where we have research doing his part in warning us where the alarms are needed or in helping us to come up with a solution. Um, and, and there's no better example uh, than, than the runaway climate crisis that we're seeing everywhere around us. And in here, you know, the, the latest research, for example, from the IPCC report, scientists actually have warned us that global greenhouse gas emissions need to be cut to 43% by 2030 to limit global warming to below 1.5 degrees. And it's especially so in Asia and the Pacific. So our joint research with other UN entities and an international think tank tells us that even if countries delivered on the existing commitments under the nationally determined contributions, greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 would increase by about 34% compared to 2010. So the exact opposite of what science is telling us. The alarm we're hearing from science about the runaway climate crisis are never so clear. So besides this alarm, research and science are actually now helping us to find a ways to avoid this catastrophic pathway of global warming. 
Oh, let me share some examples. Uh, one of them is, is greening of trade. It's something that in our region is, is still dominated by carbon intensive fossil fuels. And so to this end, uh, our work has benefited from the research, the expertise of, of the Asia Pacific Research and Training Network on Trade, or ARTNET in short. And here we see the methodologies, the modeling work of the academia network uh, under, the, under ARTNET is helping us actually to see um, what it means for, for cross-border paperless trade to be facilitated, what it means for cross-border paperless trade to be more efficient across countries. And it's something that is, is increasingly more important during COVID and in the aftermath of COVID. And we're also seeing some of these, um, some of this knowledge, some of this, this, uh, this is findings to be brought into, into actual joint dialogues and, and trainings for um, national stakeholders. So, so we're seeing um, the expertise being channeled into, into, into development. And so we actually will also rely on the work of research institutions to work with policymakers on solutions of the future, from climate change adaptation, something that especially important in our region that's so prone to climate change impacts, or innovation for social goods, something also Asia Pacific is at the very forefront. So last year, when we took stock of the good practices across the region in using geospatial data for sustainable development, we found a wide range of examples where research by universities have been very instrumental. For example, developing a, a high resolution map to reconstruct disaster affected areas in the Philippines, or some modeling work of universities for estimating climate change impacts on agriculture in Sri Lanka. So the, the examples are plenty. And we also have been able to partner with a few universities in the region to channel these very expertise into capacity building in, in doing pilot work with uh, policy makers. And for example, we, we are now helping a, a new cohorts of city mayors to explore options for, for inclusive and sustainable growth through the Asia Pacific Mayor Academy, which happens uh, annually. Or we're exploring um, with universities the, the new uh, the, the, the new partnership in ocean accounting, something that's still missing to help our countries, to help the national statistical system to, to better capture the use of marine resources and to, to evaluate the impacts of e e economic activities on the oceans. Now, um, colleagues, the, the presence of many of us today, actually, from, from different locations and areas of discipline, it, it speaks to a very fundamental element of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, that, it, that the 17 goals actually concern each and every one of us. And um, at UNESCO, uh, research and analysis are very fundamental to the work that we do, to the work that we do with countries, to the capacity building work that we do, or to informing intergovernmental uh, uh, deliberations. So uh, I really thank you for including me in this dialogue and, and it's giving me an opportunity to listen and to learn from from the distinguished scholars and the intellectuals who are here with us today and 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 to learn about the potential entry points for bridging research and and policy so thank you thank you very much indeed uh Van, for your presentation and for reminding us all that the SDGs is not something merely for uh, the governments and member states of the United Nations and the organization as a whole, but it's something that belongs to all of us and all of us have a responsibility towards it. Uh, so thank you for that. And since we have over 200 people right now uh, on, on this call, uh, allow me to remind you that after the presentations from the different speakers, we will have a portion of the activity dedicated to Q&A. Um, so feel free to paste on the chat box uh, any comment or questions you might have uh, to either all the speakers or one speaker in particular, and we will do our best to 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 reply and to answer to such questions. Um, and with that, and now we get floor to another colleague from the UN system, uh, Dr. Serge Stingvist. Uh, he's the head of research at the United Nations University Institute in Macau. Uh, before joining the Institute, he was an associate professor at the University of Caen Normandy in France and a researcher uh, in the UNMISCO International Joint Research Unit of IRD, the French Research Institute on Sustainable Development, and Université de la Sorbonne. He is an expert in artificial intelligence applied to the Sustainable Development Goals 
and a specialist in simulation and modeling of complex system. Serge, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar, for giving the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So um, welcome to my presentation. So um, I'm a computer scientist and uh, head of research at UN United Nations University Institute in Macau. So we are um, a UN research think tank working mostly on the impact of digital technologies on the sustainable development goals. So the topic that we are discussing today is, is, is very important. And uh, so our research can have a better impact on the, 30, on the 2030 agenda. And I want to approach this topic today by talking about what we are doing inside our research institute. So I will talk about uh, the importance of complex systems and participatory research towards the 2030 agenda. So first of all, let's try to discuss about a little bit about the, the interface between policy and science. So our science can help us deploy and design better policies in the long term. And in fact, we can see that uh, sustainable development goals are challenges can be seen as a wicked problem. So what is a wicked problem? It's complex issues that um, uh, normally can, uh, is difficult to solve uh, using conventional approaches. And, and, and sometimes with existing app solution, it's uh, in fact uh, creates some uh, unintended uh, consequences. So it makes the, the original problem even worse. So, and we see this kind of um, wicked problems uh, every time we, we are looking for the SDG challenges. And I, I put an illustration here on the picture on the, on the right, where you see some, uh, some of the risk uh, that the world is uh, uh, currently uh, uh, can, can potentially have in the, in the future. And you see that everything is linked, linked together. There's a lot of interactions between food crisis, water crisis, uh, immigration, cyber attacks. So everything is linked and there are, we need a way to understand better this kind of um, uh, deeply uh, interlinked uh, systems. And I think that complex system theory and complex system thinking is a way uh, to understand that. Uh, so basically, because I don't have time here to explain everything, but a complex system is composed of multiple and heterogeneous parts that interact with each other to make a coherent organization with its own behavior, its own characteristics, its own trajectories. And for example, you can have in mind the, the idea of the cities where, where you are, it's a good example of complex system where you have lots of different actors interacting with each other and the environment at different scales. Uh, let's move to the to another part of the problem because I think it's also important to, to think about the nexus between also citizen and policy and citizen and science because it's not only uh, important to solve the issues between uh, to, to find the, the to look at the nexus the interface between uh, science and policy but also that I think that the citizen are quite important and if you remember uh, you, you, if you remember the UN motto that is uh, leave no one behind so we need to also in the design of policies, uh, and we need to engage the citizen, the state stakeholders more. And there are lots of ways to do that. So in our institute, we are starting to use participatory modeling. So how to design uh, models in the context, for example, of the COVID-19 crisis together with people who are not experts in epidemiology. So there are lots of ways to do that. And I think this is quite important also to engage the people in policy making. So our institute is uh, located in Macau, and we are a research institute at the intersection between uh, digital technology and sustainable development. And we are conducting policy relevant research to address this, these issues. And in all our ongoing activities, uh, we, are, we are in fact trying to implement uh, the, the, two, the two previous uh, ideas I, I mentioned about using uh, uh, the, the tools and the frameworks of complex systems and having a more uh, participatory approach to engage the citizens. So we have done lots of activities. Uh, so because our focus is more on digital technology, we have done works on, for example, on cyber resilience. So how to engage people who are uh, working in uh, NGOs from the civil society to uh, be able to uh, be, uh, be more resilient after cyber attacks and cyber threats. Uh, recently, we have done a lot of work about AI because we know that AI, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, can impact a lot of our um, uh, society in the future. So we have started to work on the AI impact on gender issues in the Southeast Asia, Asia region, for example. 
Uh, another example of what we are doing is about the, how to uh, have better participation of citizens in the preparedness and response for the, for the next pandemic. So, uh, and uh, one of our ideas that we, maybe we can um, uh, help the, the, the people try to, people who are coming from different perspectives. So not only the expert, the scientific expert, but also the, the citizen to try to think uh, and try to find common solutions uh, together through participation. So we are uh, trying to uh, go to in the direction of uh, building this kind of collective intelligence. So the idea of trying to uh, um, uh, make an intelligence that is emerged from the collaboration, from the collective efforts and from the competitions of many individuals and machines. And uh, this is also a mandate. I uh, just want to remind you that uh, the at the UNU is also a mandate to bridge the UN system and the academic world. So if you are interested to, to know more about that, you can uh, reach out to me after that. So thank you for listening to my presentation. Back uh, to you, Omar. Thank you very much, Serge, and for reminding us the important of uh, uh, this, this policy, this public policy is related to or uh, aim at um, fostering the SDGs or advancing the SDGs you need to have a citizens component to quote your your own words, and uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that the role of universities here and the and the research centers is also critical in this regard to to make that nexus possible and reduce the gap between what what the citizens' involvement is and what the actual uh, designing and implementation and assessment of these public policies uh, uh, is is uh, in the field in practice. Um, so thank you very much. Um, now we give the floor to our very own UNAI uh, principal hub for sustainability. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Aisha Smilova. She's the director of the Van ki uh, Institute for Sustainable Development at Arafalabi Kazakh National University in Kazakhstan. Um, prior to her current position and for over a decade, she was the director of international cooperation of this university. And before that, she was a senior program specialist at Islamic World Educational scientific and cultural organization headquartered yes. in Morocco. Uh, Dr. Aisha, yes. you have the floor. Thank you very much for joining us today. Good day, dear colleagues. Well, good day, dear colleagues. I hope you see me. Or yes. you, I, I hope you hear me well enough. We are very glad to participate in today's event. Well, thank you very much one more time. And my special thanks to my colleagues at the UNI for giving us the chance to lead the United Nations Academic, the United Nations uh, Global Hub on Sustainability. That is a very great privilege for us. So right now we are, we, we, I would like to represent some information about the activities of our university, Al-Farabi Kazakh National University in Almaty, on the direction of the realization of sustainable development goals in the frames of the decade of action. Mm -hmm. Well, the principles, the main principles of the responsibility of the university of on sustainable development, economic responsibility, environmental and social responsibility. And here is some chronology of our activity. Well, starting from two, 2011, we um, started to co cooperate with the United Nations Academic Impact. And we that very year, we established the Department on Sustainable Development at our university. And I with, uh, with great pleasure, I remember the time when we met with Mr. Ramuda Modaran, the person who uh, really uh, supported our activities those times. Then we organized the whole the side event, Green Bridge Through Generations, and uh, this side event took place in Rio de Janeiro in the frames of the World Summit on Sustainable Development, Rio Plus 20. And we created or launched the International Consortium Green Bridge Through Generations. Next year, we started the project Smart Green University. Uh, together with Columbia University, we uh, launched MDP Global Classroom Project that is still rather active at our university and very popular among our students. 
So it gives a uh, good opportunity for the students to have the idea about the sustainable development in general and to provide some research in this direction. And 2014, Kaznu became UNI Global Hub on Sustainability. And um, then we created a kind of a model plan for sustainable development of universities. We tried to share this model plan. We share this model plan with our partner universities all over the world, mo mostly in the mainly in the region. And um, our Department on Sustainable Development in 2016 um, obtained the official status of UNESCO chair. So it is now we have UNESCO chair on sustainable development. We created a regional hub on sustainability and developed the master programs on sustainability in collaboration with the MDP Global Classroom program as well. And we it give, gave us the chance to participate in green metrics ranking, world ranking. In 2018, Mr. Pangemun participated in one of the big forums in our country, and that very day in May, we established the Pangemun Institute on Sustainable Development, that is the main coordinating structure at our university to coordinate the activity of the university in the realization of sustainable development goals. Well, a couple of years ago, we established Comsats for Climate and Sustainability Center that is also very act active and we work mainly with partners from Comsats that uh, the partners, the members of Comsats, the Commission of uh, the Science and Technology in the South. Well, main basic principles of promoting the concept of social responsibility of the university in the direction of sustainable development. Well, current activities, inclusion of sustainable development issue in the university, in the curricula, inclusion of sustainable development issues in the research topics of the university. That is very important because we have a number of mm, theses, papers devoted to uh, sustainable development issues. Development of cooperation and partnership programs with our other organizations and the local community for sustainable development. And creating opportunities for students and staff of the university, representatives of the local community. Uh, <clears throat> to acquire skills of social, social responsible behavior in the conditions of national and cultural diversity aimed at on sustainable development. Well, this is just the example of uh, our participation in Rio Plus 20 in 2012, where we initiated international project Green Bridge Through Generations. We um, called it Green Bridge Through Generations because it's a part of the national program Green Bridge. So through generations means that this is a very good plot platform for partner universities and organizations to work together on SDGs uh, in the frames of the international consortiums. Well, this is also the information about Green Bridge through Generations. Mm, it is the incubator for future activity of Green Bridge Partnership Program programs. This is again just the, the page from our website on Green Bridge Through Generations. If you have some interest, you can find it on, on our website. And uh, 2014, we became the Global Hub on Sustainability, the NI Global Hub on Sustainability. Now, this is the Comsat Center for Climate and Sustainability that also um, provides um, work on in education, in science, impact and cooperation. Also, some examples of the events that uh, already had been uh, hosted by our university in the frames of this uh, center. Sub-regional trainings on capacity building and environmental literacy. Again, trainings on uh, environmental literacy for personnel of specially protected areas, national parks, biosphere reserves in Central Asia. Another project, Plant Gardens.
Energy and Resource Saving Program, Green Office Kaznu. The, the, the program is also very active and popular among the students and staff. And this is one of the uh, one of the our last latest projects, urban agriculture. And we have the professor who came by Fulbright program that is one of the leaders of these um, projects. And uh, I would just uh, also like to add that um, MDP Global Classroom is uh, it, it is uh, created with partnership with SDSN. And only yesterday, the whole day until very night, we hosted Model United Nations New Silk Way. It's the annual conference for students because we institutionalized this, this program um, in 2019. So, and I will be glad to share some information and pictures about this very big Model United Nations New Silk Way with you, Omar, so that you put it on your website. So it was very interesting and I was very excited because we did not have time, chance to meet with students for two years. And yesterday, about 200 students gathered together offline and it was very excited actually. And one of the topics was also a climate change. It was infodemic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was very interesting. Thank you very much. We have you have our contact information. So we are open for any cooperation with any university. Thank you very much. And I'm very glad to see you again, Omar, because we met together. We met with you personally in 2018 when we uh, conducted the conference at the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations at the UN headquarters. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Aishan. I, I do remember you and the delegation from the university uh, from Kazakhstan when, when, when you all came to UN headquarters here in New York. Uh, we are very privileged to have you as the principal hub for sustainability. Uh, we, uh, we were glad that we were able to share the wide range of activities that you conduct, including not only research, but also this engagement with students and the community and to see that uh, the very latest updates regarding this uh, um, uh, initiatives that you are currently undertaking to advance the goals from a very, um, you know, from an overall perspective, not, not only one specific goal, but all of them actually, which is, uh, I understand, quite challenging. Uh, so thank you very much indeed once again. Um, and with that, I now give the floor to uh, Dr. Manisha uh, Vinodini Ramesh. She's the Dean of the School for Sustainable Development, the Dean of International Programs and the UNESCO Chair on Experiential Learning for Sustainable Innovation and Development at Andrita University in India. Uh, she has a PhD in Computer Science and Engineering and is the co-principal investigator of the European Commission-funded wireless sensor networks uh, with some organization capabilities for critical and emergency applications that, among other things, is capable of issuing landslide warnings, something that is very critical for um, uh, many countries uh, in the Central Asia region. Uh, with, before we give it the floor to Dr. Manisha, just a reminder to our our, our uh, attendees. Uh, again, we will have the Q&A session after the speaker's presentation, but also the recording of this um, activity will be shared with all of you once it is uploaded to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Dr. Manisha, you have the floor. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let me just share the my presentation. I hope uh, it is visible to all of you. Yes. Uh, thank you to uh, UNAI for inviting us to be part of this workshop, and we are very happy to join this group and take forward. I'm as he as Omar said, I'm Dr. Manisha from Amrita Vishwa Vidya uh, which is a university in India with the six campuses with more than 220,000 students, a multi-campus, multidisciplinary research unit. And as of today, it is regarded as one of the institution of eminence in the country and top ranked number five in the in the country with the, and also in the THE world ranking we are number one private university what makes this university different is the three pillars which we believe in which is laid out by our founding chancellor Srimata Amrathandamai Devi education for life and education for living where the purpose of education should be to impart a culture of the heart that's what we believe in and along with that another major pillar which we look forward is the compassion driven research where we use research to serve the lowest and most vulnerable strata of society and we know that we cannot solve the world's problem alone and we believe that we have to work on global challenges so we we work together as partners and then we we work together to 
provide the solution so that a global impact can be brought in to, to solve the global challenges. Today, let me talk about the compassion driven research, which is transformative and translational solutions, which is produced at Amrita University. What made us to work on this is the, the knowledge and the understanding of billions of, the, of individuals are at the bottom of the pyramid. However, there is a widening gap between science and technology are fast advancing, but the quality of life and environment are rapidly regrading. So how can we translate the advances to uplifting the villagers at the bottom of the pyramid and create a sustainable future at all? In this regard, with the direct direction from our chancellor, we have initiated the program called Living Labs, which is an experiential learning program, which is a multidisciplinary theory into practice program, which that facilitates the research, development and deployment of sustainable solutions for current challenges faced by rural communities in India. As part of the program, we choose the grand challenges using the program. We build the sustainable solution. So each and every student in the university get the opportunity to in classroom to listen the grand challenges, experiment these in the laboratories and experience in the village. So while they are in the village, they get the opportunity to embrace the culture and then get the insights, engage in the activities with the with the villagers and the communities, innovate and enhance and thus empower building the sustainable solutions. So we work on the platform. This is the platform where we work on, which is called E4 Life, which is education for life, which has four pillars, experience, embrace, engage, empower. In the experience, as I said, live, live there in the community, understand the challenges, understand the opportunities. And while you are doing, you embrace the culture, values, and challenges and systems, and engage in an individual level group and community and empower ourselves, community and stakeholders. And this has been built into the curriculum into the university through a framework of academic engagement in building sustainable communities, where we work on with the base as compassion driven research and value based education by, by including teaching learning models from participatory problem based experiential etc and community dimensions of socio cultural economic and political environmental etc and approaches and models from technology business social science change models etc leading to innovation and interdisciplinary research integration which will provide the community empowerment and wholesome learning, thus making them global citizen to build sustainable and resilient communities. And this is integrated through a four level program of living labs, which is which is implemented in the whole university as a curriculum where students go through each levels from the rural exposure to embracing to empathy to compassion to multi stakeholder engagement and prototyping the solution and then real time deployment and experience, thus making sure the environment and sustainability and lifelong learning is achieved. So different types of methodologies are used. This is just one example where when we work on livelihood, we look at different aspects of of uh, of engagement with the with the community, with the participant observation to interviews, to personas, to scenarios, to data analysis and designing prototyping implementation business model. So the first part is the inspiration, then ideation and co-design and implementation. Thus empowerment is brought in through awareness, capacity building, technology transfer and interventions of, for sustainability and each of these areas for education life for uh, e for life actually work on the emotional cognitive and behavioral changes and which will help us to build a resource our community and knowledge society and ambassador thus extending it it as a as an open minded problem solver solver capable students will be developed and achieve this we have actually built a system and adopted 20, 108 plus villages in 22 states in india and where we are working on grand challenges on energy and environment water and sanitation health and hygiene livelihood and skill development education and gender equality waste management and infrastructure agriculture and risk management and these are some of the projects which we have done in each of these areas providing water distribution systems the sustainable rural sanitation model maternal health empowering artists lemongrass destination health economics, rural electrification, uh, banana fiber, sanitary napkins, rice cycle, which is a low cost rice planting, e-cycle for providing energy and education access, sustainable li livelihood, load carrying, assisted device, etc. As of today in the pan India, this is our presence with 22 states with 63 projects, 30 plus partner universities benefiting uh, the communities. We have given solutions to each and every area in these communities. How, how did we make it sustainable and scalable transformations? If you see that one of the projects which we have 
which you have done is when the community, a uh, tribal community who didn't have the have the skills and who didn't have the livelihood, we had, had identified what is the their non skill, and then we have built a solution of solar thermal based lemongrass distillation because lemongrass is widely available in the community, and then built the solution for them. If you see that it has been done as a phased approach over the years from 2014 to 19 by integrating the students and faculty from the different disciplines and going through different phase. Also, we have done scaled up mo models where university and our parent organization has built up Amrita Shri, which is a women's self-help group where they work on small business capital, SSD formation, vocational training, life enrichment, etc. to make them empowered to bring in additional income for their, for their family. Another major scaled up projects from the student work is the Jeevam Rhythm, which is a clean drinking water solution project to provide water sustainability in communities where the university has put in 15 million as funding and and with the aim of reaching out to 5,000 communities to provide clean drinking water so solutions. And how we have done is we are working in a multidisciplinary teams and engaging with multi stakeholders from local government, community, NGO and university and collaborating with women entrepreneurs, local self government association, what level uh, water management committee and strategies in user engagement, self governance, customized technology to provide modular affordable solution, multi stakeholder engagement and community empowerment. Note we didn't finish with that. We also make sure how we how we will provide sustainable development for each community. So this this is one of the example Gupta Pada Odisha community where we have applied uh, worked on different areas health, sanitation, water, livelihood, and skill development, and provided solutions as smokeless cook stove, toilet construction, water distribution system, IoT based mushroom cultivation, and Pratan Mandri Yojana Kaushal Vikas by integrating the faculty and students from multiple campuses and also working with multiple partners. And these all have brought in scalable innovations and impacts where in the educational technology, these are the multiple solutions we have implemented in 21 states, 45,000 schools in 1.3 million virtual laboratories to provide education access in an affordable manner. Water and sanitation, if you see 27, 22 states benefited with 15 million plus people in different areas from, from clean water to wastewater treatment to smart water solution to sanitation to vertical gardens. And in skill development livelihood in 300,000 plus uh, human where we have uh, we have done toilet building and also at, at haptics where computerized vocational education for women and also, with respect to healthcare access, we have worked on wearable devices, lab on chip, AI in health, and also the COVID related research where quickly coming up sustainable solutions which was needed to take care of the to bring in the resilience to COVID. And the, these all also we work together with multiple partners also has been contributed in each of these areas, which helped us make the topmost research output bring into the, into the community as sustainable solution. And the outstanding outcome is like over the years from 2014 to 2019, you can see 186 publications from 1,368 students integrated in 60 communities with 165 projects with Amrita's funding of 4.18 crore funding. And it also led to collaborative publications, which if you see, this is one example where a bachelor student is coming up with an with a journal paper with 8.59 impact factor, working with international partners from UPC with from multiple domains. And all these things, each of these intervention has contributed to STG, different STGs at, diff at different target levels, STG one and SDG 3, SDG 4, SDG 5, SDG 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 13 and 17 on each of these solutions it has taken. So thus we are able to take forward the compassion driven research but to ac providing accessibility, affordability and availability and thus reaching sustainable development by providing solutions in education access, water access and quality, healthcare access, skills and development, infrastructure, energy access, climate change, hazards, risk mitigation and agriculture which has made us to be in the 41st in, in the world for the impact ranking, 8 in good health and well-being, 8 in gender equality, 15 in clean water and sanitation, 32 in quality education, 200 in industry, innovation and infrastructure. And all these are possible because of our guiding light who has told us that when we try to love or serve without understanding those whom we are serving, we often end up harming society and ourselves. In order to service to be beneficial, it needs to go hand in hand with discernment. This is the essence of sustainable development and this is what we are trying to do and will. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Manisha. I understand I can see the very comprehensive set of uh, research projects that are conducted by 
uh, your uh, university. And so I understand it's very challenging to just summarize in just such a short period of time all the all the wonderful things that have been done by the by the university. Uh, so we appreciate how concise you were to present all this. And uh, I was uh, struck by the, this term grand challenges, which are which are actually quite similar to the SDGs. So I understand the similarities and, and how the work that you are doing connect with the SDGs as a whole. Um, so thank you, Dr. Manisha, once again. Um, just as, uh, uh, as I received some comments uh, through the chat box and also via email, we will be sharing the recording of this uh, of this activity once again. But also, if you need to connect with the speakers, you're more than, more than welcome to do so through the chat box and the speakers. Uh, because of our privacy guidelines, we cannot share the emails of the speakers uh, publicly unless they, they decide or choose to do that themselves. So the speakers that, are, that already uh, took the floor and those who are, will, will be taking the floor shortly um, are more than welcome to share the contact information through the chat box uh, if they if they want to do so. And it's very inspiring to see all this interaction happening through the chat box. So thank you once again and feel free to put your comments and questions there as well. Um, and with that, I now give the floor to our next speakers is Dr. Xu Feng Xu. Uh, he is Professor and Associate Dean at the School of Public Policy and Management and Executive Director of the Institute for Sustainable Development Goals at the Tsinghua University in the People's Republic of China. He also serves as a Regional Editor of the Asian Journal of Political Sciences and as the Associate Editor of the Journal of Comparative Policy Analysis. With a PhD in public management, he has won many national academic awards, including the China National Science Fund, for Distinguished Young Scholars of China in 2016. Dr. Xu, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, this is a great uh, opportunity for us to share uh, with you about uh, what we have done. So let me share my screen. So uh, on behalf of, uh, of our university and our institute, the Institute for Sustainable Development Goals, I would like to uh, talk something about what, what we have done. Uh, Tsinghua's contribution uh, toward the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, as you know that uh, Tsinghua University is the uh, best uh, university in China, and uh, all of them, all of the university activities are related with SDGs. So last year, uh, our uh, last year is uh, was the uh, 110th anniversary of our university. Therefore, our university released uh, the SDG report uh, uh, during our uh, anniversary. So uh, this is our report, the uh, release uh, celebrate, uh, and uh, the that part of uh, this report, the the cover of our report. So. Uh, Basically speaking, um, so this is a full map of our Tsinghua's SDG activities. For example, the number of the our courses related to the SDGs. We have uh, over 2,300 courses uh, related with SDGs and uh, undergraduate level and the grad postgraduate levels. And also we have number, uh, we have a uh, 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 this period is uh, uh, from uh, 2016 to 2020. So uh, the number of the research projects re related with the SDGs, we have uh, over 9,200 uh, project research projects related with uh, the 17, 17 SDGs. And uh, the uh, we have uh, 400 over 400 uh, 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 training programs related uh, with uh, SDGs. Uh, for training, which means uh, they have uh, no degree project, but uh, we also uh, uh, train uh, uh, for the society. And also, uh, we uh, released uh, Tsinghua's news uh, related with SDGs. So we have uh, over uh, 49,000 pieces of news uh, about SDGs. So uh, specifically, we uh, uh, we talk about the scientific research related with SDGs. So uh, in Tsinghua University, there are 401 and 10 uh, 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 university level uh, research centers, such as centers, uh, labs, and also others. And within the 410 uh, research centers, uh, over 100, 107, 
uh, university level think tanks, which is uh, which are policy research research centers, uh, 107, and also uh, over uh, 9,000 research projects, which I just mentioned. And also uh, last five years, we have uh, over 10,000 patents related with SDGs. So uh, let me uh, specifically uh, uh, introduce the SDG Institute because this is uh, uh, an institute established just for uh, to implementing SDGs. We have four rules, uh, uh, roles. Uh, one is talent training. The other is a research center. The second, the third is a, a think tank. Uh, the fourth is international network and uh, 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 cooperation. So uh, this um, uh, institute, which I am the uh, executive uh, director of, of this uh, research institute, was established in uh, 2017 uh, in May. So uh, actually, uh, we have a, a joint degree uh, master program. Uh, uh, we uh, cooperate between Tsinghua University and the University of Geneva. So since 2018, uh, uh, till now, uh, we already admitted uh, 106 uh, students and uh, 30 over 30 students uh, uh, will graduate uh, in this uh, summer. And also uh, we have uh, 77 candidates apply to the uh, Tsinghua University for the next uh, cohort. So uh, the distribution of our students, uh, 30 a 37 percent of uh, the students are from China, but uh, uh, 67 percent of the students are from overseas, uh, 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 such as uh, uh, Asia, Russia, North America, South America, Africa, and Oceania. So this is a distribution of the female and the male. Uh, next, uh, we uh, uh, between uh, uh, we have different uh, principles and. Uh, 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 research, research and the teaching uh, uh, logic. Uh, we have a theoretical understanding. Uh, we we train students have theoretical standing understandings, hybrid teaching, and the platform global platform. We link strong link with the international organizations, and also we uh, serve the students. And we have the uh, international classrooms and so on. So uh, for the uh, researchers and activities of uh, SDG institutes, uh, just that the in case, uh, that, that's the example in 2021, uh, we have uh, 20 plus academic activities and uh, three social media platforms and uh, uh, 24 research projects, five reports and uh, uh, 56 uh, publications. And we are the hub of the SDSN and other international organizations, and also we have three initiatives for green development and net zero, uh, zero, and also we have uh, several uh, capacity building training programs. So uh, for the uh, research projects, uh, the there are different uh, uh, research areas such as uh, SDG localization. Uh, we research on the relations between central and the local governments, and and also the localization of SDG achievement uh, in Beijing, Wuhan, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and so on. And then we research on the pathways and evaluation of the different areas of uh, 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 sectors uh, for SDGs and uh, Chinese uh, experience in SDGs and also Bell Road Initiative and SDG, SDGs. For the research areas, uh, we have uh, ESG, like a public awareness, SDG education, poverty alleviation, and philanthropy, and the climate change, and the foreign aid, and the international organizations. They are all our research uh, areas. So uh, let me take some uh, examples. For example, uh, TUSDG has collaborated with the local governments in China to carry out the research on uh, policy and the implementation plan for Guangzhou City's uh, 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 sustainable development. So Guangzhou City is a, a volunteer, volunteer local review for UN SDG report. And also we collaborate with uh, UN, UN, uh, UNDP China uh, with the study on the innovative low carbon transformation path at the national 
uh, high tech zone uh, with the carbon peak and the carbon neutrality goals. And also we have a different policy and the research projects such as the uh, uh, research on the evaluation system construction and the implementation path of UN 2030 agenda for sustainable development and the research report on the local evaluation and the prospects uh, of SDG in China uh, measurement basis uh, based on the pro uh, provincial data uh, from 20, uh, 2004 and 2017. So and also we have uh, another report, a very uh, important report on the uh, Bell, uh, Bell Road Initiative Green Development Report. Uh, this report was uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, Ministry of uh, uh, Ecological and uh, Environmental Protection. And also uh, within this project, we uh, we select 88 Bell Road countries and uh, uh, build a system with uh, 27 indicators covering different uh, uh, dimensions. OK, that's all my presentation. Thank you for, atten for your attention. Uh, this is our slogan of our uh, university. Strive for the excellence and innovate for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dr. Xu. Uh, we are fully aware of this collaboration that has been conducted within the, your university and the United Nations system and the University of Geneva as well. Uh, something that has been informed by UNIS uh, Geneva. Our colleagues there. Um, so it's truly wonderful to see all these collaboration arrangements that the university has, well, which actually is an SDG in itself. SDG 17, precisely partnership for the goals, is something, is a, perhaps a goal that I always, I always say somehow neglected in the discussion, but probably is one of the most important ones because the governments cannot do everything by themselves. So the importance of stakeholders such as uh, academia and, and, and research centers is of fundamental importance, uh, especially after the COVID and during and the still ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. I think we have learned uh, the hard way perhaps that, uh, you know, the, the more alliances, the more partnerships we create and foster, the better. To, to advance the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, uh, especially considering that the, the drawbacks that we have seen in the past couple of years. So Dr. Xu, thank you for your intervention. Um, I will now now give the floor to Professor Tony Kappen uh, from Australia. He's the director of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute at Monash University. Uh, he also holds a chair in planetary health uh, in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine and is currently a member of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, uh, I used to be a member, I'm sorry, of the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. Prior to this, he was the director of the International Institute for Global Health at the United Nations University. Uh, his research focuses are urbanization, sustainable development and human health. Uh, Professor Kaplan, you have the floor. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Omar. Terrific. Uh, to be with you today. I'm just uh, trying to share my screen here. Um, the, uh, just having some trouble. Do you do, do, do you want me to share those from my end? Uh, yes, I think that might be good because I, I can't see, uh, for some reason I can no longer see the window. OK, let, let me open myself the yeah. presentation. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. You may bear with me one second. Can you see the slides? I can, thank you. And can you put them into the uh, the view? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Terrific. And uh, as I begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land I'm on today. Uh, the I'm on Wurundjeri country, uh, people of the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne, Australia. So Omar, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, uh, strategy on a page presents our approach at the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. So you can see at the top of this slide, our headline purpose to advance the well-being of people and planet 
for current and future generations. And on uh, the right-hand side at the top there, our five-year vision to be a globally recognised leader in system transformation for sustainable development. So our work in the Institute is very much focused on transforming systems for sustainable development. And then in that dark band uh, across the page, uh, we work to understand, influence and transform systems for sustainable development in Australia and our region, particularly Southeast Asia and Pacific Island countries, uh, collaborating with partners to build knowledge and capacity and drive practical change. We, of course, also do a number of programs at the global level with our partners around the world. In the middle there, you can see our four primary domains for our work, climate action, environment and health, sustainable cities and regions, circular economy, inclusive prosperity and leadership for the SDGs. Uh, our institute is the Asia, uh, is the Australian, New Zealand Pacific uh, Centre for the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, next slide, please, Omar. We have a number of large-scale transdisciplinary research projects. One here, revitalizing informal settlements and their environments rise. This work is done with partners in Fiji and Indonesia, and it's trialing innovative and sustainable water and sanitation solutions in 24 informal settlements. We work closely with communities, governments, local leaders, and global partners. And you can see there that this work primarily focuses on those six SDGs, with human health, SDG 3, as the key outcome of concern, and nature-based solutions uh, in informal settlements, the key intervention. Next slide, please, Omar. Another program that's getting underway, Fire to Flourish. Here we're working in partnership with four affected uh, communities, particularly badly affected communities, from those devastating 2019-2020 bushfire season. Uh, some of our participants today may remember uh, the media coverage of those devastating fires in southeastern Australia. And here, again, we're working closely with local communities and this work is being co-designed and co-led with Indigenous people in those communities. And here you can see the six primary SDGs uh, associated with this program. Next slide, please. We also have two major centres within uh, MSDI, Climate Work Centre uh, focused on pathways uh, to accelerate decarbonisation in critical sectors, uh, working in Australia and across the region. And next slide, Omar. Our uh, Behaviour Work Centre, uh, bringing uh, insights on human behaviour and human behaviour change uh, to achieve broader transformation for sustainable development. Next slide, please. And here, I won't go through these in details, but there are a number of other multi-SDG initiatives across Monash University uh, here in Melbourne, but also in our campuses in other countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, India, and uh, Italy. Next slide, please. And here, uh, our research outputs by SDG. And you can see that our research touches all of the SDGs but uh, notably SDG 3 there, you can see off the chart in terms of scale, because we have a particularly large uh, uh, focus in our institute, on, uh, in, in our university on human health and well-being. Next slide, please. And our new Monash strategic plan advanced by University President Margaret Gardner is to focus increasingly our work on big challenges of the age for the betterment of our communities locally and globally with three core focus areas, climate change, geopolitical security and thriving communities. Next slide. And currently in our institute, we're working with UN colleagues on the Global Sustainable Development Report, the next iteration due to be published in 2023. 
Many of you will know that the GSDR is a UN publication prepared every four years by an independent group of scientists to provide evidence-based guidance on the state of global sustainable development. And uh, uh, we have uh, MSDI researchers a part of this process. And you can see here on the right uh, that we're engaging stakeholders across Australia and the Pacific uh, to capture insights uh, from the region. Next slide, please. And in our work with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Tal Keston and colleagues have a particular focus on engaging universities with the SDGs. Some of you may have seen uh, this guidance getting started with the SDGs in universities that's been translated into a number of languages. Next slide, please. So final slide, Omar, uh, finding out more about what we do, uh, a link to our website on the left, the Monash Strategy, uh, our SDG report for the university, and that uh, work on getting started with the SDGs in universities. Thank you very much, Omar. Thank you, uh, Professor Kaplan, for, for your presentation on behalf of uh, Monash University. Uh, of course, uh, we are a partner of SDSN as well, so uh, we are very familiar with the work that you, you did uh, to, to make this toolkit available, which has been translated in several languages uh, so far on how to in incorporate the SDGs. And as my colleague Joshua mentioned at the very beginning, we're working on a toolkit of our own. I'm sure we can learn quite a lot, so we invite Monash University as, as well as the other universities uh, uh, that are present uh, on this call to, to share the thoughts and inputs uh, with us. Uh, and we are also familiar with the Monash University contribution to the uh, Global Sustainable Development Report, uh, will be, which will be launched uh, some months from now. Um, and I was uh, struck to see, uh, you know, I'm very glad to see this collaboration with many stakeholders, but also the focus, the regional focus of many of the work and research conducted, SDG related research conducted by the university in the uh, in the Pacific region, particularly in developing countries, uh, in developing small island states uh, there. So I'm sure uh, this, this arrangement will continue. And of course, I can see uh, you know, the significant relevance that is being given to SDG3, in particular, something very timely in consideration of the of the of the pandemic where we're all uh, facing uh, and probably we, we need to prepare ourselves to the future pandemic. So there's a lot of work being done on that front uh, in many universities. Uh, thank you, Professor Kaplan, once again. And last but not much. least, uh, we have with us Professor Gillian Lewis. She's the Associate Dean of Sustainability at the Faculty of Science at, of the University of Auckland in New Zealand, uh, which serves as the UNAI SDG Hub for Goal 4, Quality Education. She's also the lead academic on the sustainable strategy of, for the university. Uh, her research focuses on the interactions of complex microbial communities and their response to natural and anthropogenic impacts in freshwater environments and the safety of drinking water, beaches and marine waters and the transmission routes of waterborne pathogens. Uh, Professor Lewis, it's a privilege. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Omar. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I greet you in the uh, the language of the Tangata Whenua, the native people uh, of New Zealand. And um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you briefly uh, tonight. I knew that I would be last on the list and I knew that uh, time would be running short. So um, I have got quite a, a brief presentation for you today. I will just um, share my single slide. It's very information dense. Okay, I think that should be sharing my slide now, I hope. Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you, Omar. Okay, um, our university, Waipapa Taumatarau, the University of Auckland, um, is a, um, a university uh, which is uh, full service. We have a whole range of departments and faculties ranging from full-on uh, structural engineering through to the creative arts and industries and covering science, law, arts, um, and of course, medicine. Um, 
We have had an, an interesting experience in terms of the SDGs over a number of years. Our university has been served very well by a sustainability office, and um, that office has attempted to accumulate and understand our contribution to the SDGs over time. More recently, with the innovation of the um, Times Higher Education uh, ranking against the SDGs, we decided we would give that a go. Um, and that was quite important to us because it made us sit step back and ask ourselves the question of how we are contributing to the SDGs and what does our research contribute and which of our researchers contribute. That led to developing um, a system, an algorithm, by which we could understand that contribution uh, from all of our publications in any uh, given time or any uh, given year. Now, the result of that was that we did surprisingly well in the first iteration of the Times Higher Education, uh, ranked first. The second year, we also ranked first. Um, and in the four years now, we've always been in the top 10 uh, of that particular ranking, uh, currently sitting in there at number six. And in terms of the SDGs, we find that we do rank extremely highly in research for six of those um, and very highly for a further five. So performing right across the board in our university in terms of research. Now, what has that done for us? Well, that said to us, we have a whole range of research which is it's contributing and contributing in various ways. Do we know this? How did we know this before we did it? How did the uh, um, researchers know this before they uh, planned their research? Because we know research will take time. Um, and that has, um, through our algorithm, given us the opportunity to go back to researchers and identify for them and with them the contribution they're making. Now, that's been quite an eye opener for many of our, our researchers who didn't realise how quite how they were contributing, um, but who now are thinking along the lines of how do I best contribute? So this made a difference. And what is the difference it's made to our university? Well, that made us realise that we had a huge resource of our, you know, almost two and a half thousand academics contributing um, to the SDGs in their own way. But that wasn't coordinated and it wasn't really making um, the impact on our university that perhaps it should have been making. And that's led us over the last few years to think about um, how do we then capital well, how do we then start to embody that as a university, our contribution to the world in uh, this way? And we have a number of advantages, and this is the second part of my slide. We recognize then that um, our place is really important here. Um, New Zealand has this image of being a nice clean green country that may or may not be true, but there's an ethos here for us and for uh, the academics at the university and for the researchers throughout the country. Our government, our current government, has a really high sustainability profile. And there's still a very strong acceptance of the value of research, which means we feel our work is valued here. Now, where has this taken us? Well, in our institution over the last couple of years, we've established a new strategic plan, Tamata Teite. And the vision is that we'll be internationally recognised for our unique contribution to fair, ethical and sustainable societies. We're applying principles across that of caring for people, of manaakitanga, of caring for relationships, of whanangatanga and of caring for the natural world in kaitiakitanga. And our first stated priority impact is leading transitions to sustainable ecosystems. So we've now changed from being a group of disparate researchers who um, were contributing in their own way, whether they knew it or not, to a university coordinating our activities. So rather than having an institute for SDGs, we now have a university uh, for contributing to the SDGs. Um, we also have strong opportunities in our multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary capability. And that's largely because we are a full service university. We do have everybody on site. 
um, we also have the opportunity to partner. In New Zealand, small country, quite restricted funding opportunities and cross-disciplinary imperatives are incredibly strong because the funding uh, streams are better in those places. So again, another incentive uh, for this kind of work. OK, so the university is developing well here. I should comment too on the work going on in our SDG4 hub. Um, this hub has um, this year, on the last couple of years, particularly been focusing on COVID. We know that uh, post-COVID, um, our education systems have been set back quite significantly. Children aren't turning up to school um, and we know that the social uh, support structures offered by schools have not functioned well in the last couple of years. So there is significant research going on in terms of um, COVID uh, returning to school and getting students back to school post COVID. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there are other research that I would uh, tell you about, but Omar has appeared, so I suspect that means it's about time for me to finish. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to talk to you uh, today. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lewis. Um, and uh, since uh, I believe a couple of people through the chat box ask, we will be sharing the presentations and slides that were shared by the speakers. I can only ask, ask the speakers, those who have, uh, you know, there are a couple of speakers, I believe, that already shared with me the slides. In the, in the other cases, please do share those with me at your earliest convenience so we can share those uh, with the attendees. Uh, and, and in addition to the link to the to the to the recording of this activity that will be uploaded to our YouTube video later in the day, uh, as, as as we said earlier, at the very beginning of our of our event is three and a half almost a.m. Uh, here in New York. So bear with us. Uh, it will take some hours before we our colleagues go to work and and do um, the recap of this activity. And now allow me to be before we conclude to to me perhaps a couple of questions. I can we ask. Uh, all the speakers to to turn off their their cameras uh, if possible, uh, so we can uh, take a look at the panel as a whole. Um, so I have a question uh, regarding the first one would be perhaps a more obvious question uh, about how COVID-19 pandemic actually impacted research conducted at universities and in the case of my colleague Van uh, in Bangkok, how how the work of UNESCAP was impacted because of COVID-19 when it comes to SDGs. Um, so not only what impact there was, but also what lessons we learned uh, with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of uh, how to foster or improve or enhance the research by the universities towards the SDGs. I can ask you to be mindful of the time. Um, so whoever wants to, to address this particular question, please feel free to, to speak. Yes, Professor Kaplan. Yeah, thank you, Omar. I guess just a couple of quick things to say that um, clearly uh, where research was being conducted in other countries, it was particularly challenging for that exchange um, because so much international travel was impacted by the pandemic. Uh, and importantly, we need to think carefully about the impact of the pandemic on our early career researchers who haven't had an opportunity uh, to travel internationally and make those trusted relationships uh, with their colleagues. They might be uh, doing their PhD or in that first stage um, postdoc. So we really need to think about strategies uh, to support those early career researchers. On the upside though, uh, we've all learned new technologies and uh, to use uh, facilities like this one tonight, which uh, does enable a lower carbon uh, form of exchange uh, between researchers. So just a few thoughts there, Omar. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaplan. Dr. Manisha. Thank you, Omar. Uh, so during the pandemic, one of the major things we could achieve was, you know, working with the community virtually from far from far from their communities. And we were able to empower them to and build their capacities. 
over the network, over the network, and then provide them the opportunities to take care of resilience to COVID. So they have they have started looking into the sanitation, the health, health practices, and at the same time looking into like you know building masks, making producing masks, etc. And for the university side to build the research and and also the collaborations, we were able to have the the online joint programs with different universities. As, as we formed the groups and then we worked on the different problems where the design and the research was developed during this phase so that the moment it is opened up, they could go and deploy it. So the new ways of doing it, new ways of approaches have, have been developed. And I think it gave also an opportunity for community to get empowered in a little more easier, easier way. And wherever we had a deeper relationship, it helped us just to explore better. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Manisha. One. Yeah, just just to chat, add in that you know over the past two years we quickly jumped into the virtual mode. Uh, everybody has gone online with our work, uh, but perhaps um, from from a substantive per perspective, we all know that the, the COVID nineteen pandemic affects every single one of us, and and it, it is making achieving the SDGs a lot more difficult. Uh, like I said, we're already 30, 40 years behind, but perhaps it's going to be much further with this, this pandemic. And then last year when we did a report, we did the annual assessment of the SDGs and, and we found out that um, the statistical operations were actually disrupted during the pandemic. Face-to-face um, -face data collection was disrupted, uh, statistical office, some managed to resume the data collection processes, but a lot were, were disrupted. So, uh, the without actual data, without authoritative and, and accurate data, we cannot measure our progress. We cannot know where we are and what we need to, to prioritize as we as we deal with the remaining years of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable uh, Development. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Van. Dr. Xu. Yes, um, the effect of the uh, the impact of the COVID-19 is huge every for everything, uh, you know, for the um, uh, like economic growth, uh, like uh, international trade, consumption, uh, and also education for our uh, universities and also others. So uh, for us, uh, because all we are the um, the school of public policy and management, and also we are the uh, Institute for Research, uh, Institute for SDGs. Uh, we we did a lot of researches on how to recover from the SDGs and also for some uh, research on local uh, governance and also the uh, uh, some um, uh, em uh, emergency man management and also vaccine uh, researches and uh, vaccine uh, re uh, distribution uh, globally and also other lot of things and also uh, international uh, uh, supply chains and so on. So actually uh, pandem the pandemic uh, is maybe uh, would be a, a turning point of our SDGs because uh, from the uh, since uh, 2015 uh, our achievement uh, to 2030 agenda is a uh, uh, it's grossly, uh, it's, uh, it's very good. Uh, but uh, uh, since 2020, uh, many uh, goals, uh, for example, the edu uh, so education for health and uh, also others uh, has uh, some declined. Uh, but another thing uh, for environment, because a lot of uh, uh, industry and uh, international travel uh, have stopped. So uh, for uh, climate change, could be a good for uh, the, the the pandemic could be good for climate change and uh, for carbon uh, emission reduction. Uh, however, uh, for some countries uh, that uh, they would like to uh, more uh, recover uh, and uh, more quickly recover, uh, they would be uh, more uh, uh, put more investment and uh, stimulate the in, uh, the econo economies. So they will, because of you know uh, the uh, humans' uh, life is more important for climate change. This is our ideology. So, so for the countries, they will pass away the um, the uh, climate change, but they will 
put more investment and uh, stimulate the economy with uh, uh, more carbon in, uh, in density industry. Uh, that could be a worse uh, issue or uh, uh, the, the side of the, um, uh, the issue of the e effect of the um, pandemic. OK, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xu. Uh, Dr. Aishan. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, pandemic, it's a kind of a stick with two ends. On the one hand, we became closer because we were online and we're still online. And we finally <laughs> got acquainted with our partners online. So we became closer. And we, even with the students. On the other hand, it opened and revealed many of the problems that the society, our society had. Many of the families became poor. And especially, uh, well, speaking about the university, our international students who stuck in Kazakhstan when the borders were closed, they became poor and really suffered. And we tried to help them. And what I really appreciate, our students, they gathered food, they gathered everything to help our international students who stuck here. You see, so it just revealed our problems that we had. We tried to manage all these problems. On the other hand, we got different grants, for example, from ISESCO, who financed the project on the production of antiseptics. So our scholars in, um, invented some kind of antiseptic who that was used by the university then. So we did not buy antiseptics and some some uh, something for to protect from this. COVID, we used it produced by ourselves and everything was financed by the organization. That was also one of the good things of this. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aishan. And uh, I kindly ask attendees to bear with us for five more minutes and the speakers as well. Uh, I have a second and final question. Um, this is regarding one of the objectives of this workshop, just, just to see how we can narrow the gap between research and you know policies and 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 how to how to actually uh, have better informed decisions based on the outcomes of the research that is being conducted in universities and research centers so in that sense how do you see that that gap can be narrow if not eliminated at all uh whatsoever how can the research made in university be more impactful and be you know, to be taken more into the consideration. And I take uh, Professor Lewis' uh, remarks when, when she said, well, we researchers, you know, we, we are a university for the SDGs and, and the researchers somehow needs to be in this, uh, in a reflection mode to see what they are doing, how they are doing things, uh, to see how impactful they are. So I, I open the floor to whoever wants to ask to reply to that question. Uh, yes, Sarsh. Um, yes, I, I think this is this is very important uh, um, point to uh, how to reduce the gap between the research and policy. So, I think there are. Um, I, mean, I don't have any definite answer, but I think there are many ways to 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 think about that. And and to, I think what is important in terms of research is to try to conduct more uh, multidisciplinary research because there. There are lots of different kind of expertise that uh, maybe have sometimes that, that are sometimes contradictory. So we have to find a way to, first of all, to uh, find a way to discuss among ourselves, the researchers, uh, and uh, try to find solutions, uh, share knowledge between our disciplines, and after that, uh, uh, be involved in uh, yeah decision uh, with decision makers. So try to find ways to. Uh, build tools together, build models together in order to to reduce these gaps. Uh, so there is still a long, yeah, way to, to to move forward for us to to go in that direction. And at UNU, we, this is a UN United Nations University. This is something that we are trying to to do in order to reduce the gap between uh, between science and policy. Thank you, Serge. Uh, Professor Lewis. I think that uh, one of the ways to do this is to consider um, quite large scale audacious or embracing um, research projects where we um, set a, a big target for New Zealand um, or for wherever. For example, we've started about 10 years ago a Growing Up in New Zealand project where a large number of children are being followed 
um, uh, over their lives from a whole range of different ethnic groups within New Zealand to to follow um, the the different um, the way they're growing, the way they're learning, the way they tackle school, the kinds of purchasing decisions they make, and then involving as many different research groups as possible into that kind of work, and inevitably involving government into that work as well. And uh, that then leads directly, as we see it, to making a very real difference. Thank you, Professor Lewis. Uh, Dr. Manisha. Thank you, Omar. It's a very good question, actually. Uh, in Amrita's experience of uh, working with the community for a long time, what we have felt is like if we initiate our research from the challenges, what the community feels. So that is one way where they get involved with us. And in each steps, if they are with us, then it is easy for us to engage and come up with a solution that is useful for the community. And this way, when you work, you are also able to bring in policy changes and at the same time, making community understand what is the current policy, how you can utilize this policy to achieve their needs. So when we were working with respect to the water wise community and also the skill development, there were a lot of national mission policies available, but the community were unaware of it. And when we start working with them, when we lived in the community, we understood what is the challenge. They became open enough to tell us what it is. And that helped us to map these things. What is existing? What is not there? What are the gap? And then where the change needs to come in? And we firmly believe that if this has to happen, there has to be a long term relationship and trust needs to be built in. For a university to build this, one of the major things what Amrita has done is we have developed a program called E4 Life PhD program, where the students are recruited, the PhD students are recruited, especially to work in the communities where they understand what are the challenges they live in the community and then build solutions for them. So over the four years, they build that trust in, in the community and then take forward. So and they are trained as a multidisciplinary students with the transdisciplinary capabilities, which are helping them to work with the community, hold hand in hand, work together and build solutions, which will also provide an opening into understanding the policies, its implementations, its empowerment, etc. So it's a long term, it's a longer trajectory, but it's a very involved and engaged trajectory, which has to be that and taken for it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manicha. And last but not least, uh, Professor Kaplan. Yeah, thanks very much, Omar. And I'd my um, comments follow on very nicely from Manisha's because uh, from the way that we work and many of our partners work, it's very much about co-design and co-production of knowledge. So as Manisha said, um, we're researchers in universities working closely with communities or with policymakers uh, to identify the big challenges and then to investigate them together. And uh, I think that sets us up, as Manisha said, uh, for the knowledge to be used in, in the relevant context. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kaplan. Uh, we are receiving some questions through the chat box. Unfortunately, we run out of time. Uh, however, we kindly uh, invite uh, attendees who are posting these comments and questions to, to put their contact information there if they, if they want to do so. Uh, and the speakers might contact you uh, in the near future. Also, the speakers, once again, you are more than welcome to put their, their contact details and information there in the chat box for our attendees to, to, to see. Uh, we are going to publish the video recording of this activity on our YouTube channel. We will share as well, once again, um, the slides and presentations that were uh, shared today uh, by the, our distinguished speakers. It has been a privilege to address to you. I hope I was articulated enough this by the very early uh, morning time here in New York, uh, so I'm going back to bed after this uh, uh, after this activity. Uh, my true appreciation, and on behalf of uh, Yashri Wyatt, who spoke at the beginning of this event, uh, allow me to actually quote her. Uh, she sent me a message um, before she jumped off uh, from the building. Um, uh, 
these scholars are the life breaths of our collective understanding of the critical challenges we currently face and form the basis of policy making. We cannot underestimate their role and contributions to the implementation of the SDGs and the achievement of the 2030 agenda. I echo her words, and it's truly a privilege to see how many universities, institutions of higher education, research centers, and in, in you know, heavily involved and invested in, in the advancement of the 2030 agenda. Uh, and one of you said, well, the SDGs belong to all of us. Um, and uh, I'm sure uh, UNESCO uh, in Bangkok also has a wide range of partnership with academia and research centers and uh, the UN, we understand the, the meaningful value of the research being conducted by your institutions and, and many more uh, around the world. And with that, uh, a very early good morning from New York, good afternoon and good evening to all of you around the world. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Emma. Thanks all. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you, Omar. Omar. Thank you. It is just a fan cake, this cake cakes, nobody's